start letting people in here. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good to see you on our final exciting day of this conference, this convention online. Gathering wonderful folks from throughout the world. Our morning sessions here, at least our time, UN, United States, um, seem to be our appropriate sessions for the uh, European folks. So we've had a little bit of pattern here starting our day with uh, with the Europeans in the group. Um, so that's kind of a fun way to get started. And everybody out there has got some fresh and new and even if it's old, uh, like uh, Paul McNulty, uh, sort of unique and quirky new things to talk about. So very exciting. So I'll just let people, I'll just wait like one minute. We would we'll probably not wait fully until five after to get everybody in here. Um, but we'll wait a minute or two just to get everybody settled. I'll give you uh, some guidelines for questions uh, in the in the time being. So for questions during uh, David Clavin's lecture, what we'll do is you know write your comments and questions in the chat, and uh, I will uh, I'll filter them into the conversation uh, when there's good moments. David will open up officially for questions maybe a little bit later on in the lecture, and um, if there's any uh, pressing reason why we want to open up for some discussion, then, you know, at, at our discretion, we'll unmute uh, anybody. So if you do feel like you have something interesting to say, um, you know, private message me or something, we can open up the, the mic and we can have a little chat. All right. Okay, cool. Well, and, and I know there's probably about um, 10 or 15 more people that should be here, but also want to be efficient and respectful of time. So I'm going to go ahead and launch us off with this lecture. I'll introduce our guest, spotlight him here so you can get a good look at his pretty face. And uh, <laughs> I'll introduce David Clavins. Uh, David Clavins accomplished his degree as a master piano builder in January 1980 in Stuttgart, Germany, after having founded his first piano company in 1976 in Bonn, Germany. While initially specializing in the rebuilding of older pianos, in the course of his work, he was studying the factors that mainly determine the acoustic char characteristics of the piano and has uh, essentially come up with his own new and uh, iconoclastic brand of piano. So we'll listen to what he has to say. He's going to focus on a relatively recent incarnation of his, his piano is called the Unicorda. So David, take it away and, and let me know when you, you'd like me to pull the presentation up. Thank you. <clears throat> so hello, everybody. I'm very uh, pleased to be part of this great community and have the opportunity to introduce you to my work. And uh, as Ethan already said, uh, please feel free to ask any questions um, that come up during the presentation. And uh, we can, after the presentation, we can get back to any subject, like to any slide that I have prepared. Ethan has a, 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 a steer a slideshow where I have bullet, bullet points that I will be talking about. And uh, maybe for the flow of the, uh, for the, uh, of the presentation, it may be useful that you note your questions, as Ethan said uh, on the, in the chat. And I'll be happy to answer each and every one, uh, except political subjects. Please don't ask me about politics. Okay. Okay, Ethan, let's go. If it's a country that uh, is relatively, what about like, uh, you know, Icelandic politics or something? I don't know. Not just kidding. Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> some, some country. <laughs> relatively <I> uncontroversial. <laughs> about I don't know anything. <laughs> All right, I'll pull up the presentation and we'll go in one sec. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can start out with the second slide. The first one says, says what we know, Clarence Pianos, Latvia. So I want to uh, introduce you briefly uh, to the uh, history, how I came about to 
develop my own pianos, what motivated me and uh, how that all sort of say happened. I will not spend too much time on this history, but for clarity of and understanding my approach, maybe it's, it's not bad. So apprenticeship from 1971 till 74 at the Schimmel company in Germany, Braunschweig, which back then was the biggest industrial manufacturer of pianos. And uh, at Schimmel, I was like the apprenticeship in Germany goes, you learn everything basic about the piano, but essentially I knew only the Schimmel pianos and my, my mother's old piano at home. So that's why I joined the workforce at the piano store right after I finished my apprenticeship in 74 and was working two years as a tuner and technician and uh, learning about all the various pianos that are out there. And it was quite many surprises among that. One of the surprises was how many old fine looking and great sounding pianos there were that I had never heard about all kinds of brands that uh, didn't exist anymore. Or also the well-known brands that still like old Seiler pianos, for example, that seemed to me nicer than the present ones, including the Schimmel pianos. And so while I was working at the piano store, uh, I noticed that the dealers in, that was in Bonn, Germany, uh, that the dealers actually disregarded all the old pianos, essentially. They were very keen to sell new pianos and it was a good time with the, the uh, new piano sales were uh, developing in a, at a hefty pace, you could even say. And so no, no, none of the shops were really interested in doing repairs or rebuilding old pianos. And I've, when I found out that this is the case, I then decided to uh, become self-employed, establish my own piano workshop in 1976, after two years of working at the Fisher Piano Store in Bonn. And focusing on rebuilding of old pianos was a good decision. I more or less from the get-go, I had lots of clients and the business developed uh, at a really nice pace. Actually, pretty soon I had more to do than I could accomplish. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, while I was doing the repairs, and that was uh, also one factor why I hardly could accomplish all my orders was that from the beginning, I was investigating very in-depth uh, what each piano that came into my workshop, I was very curious to find out what's the difference, uh, differences of, the, of this piano compared to the pianos I knew or I had already seen. And um, in particular, as we were doing total rebuildings like new strings, uh, new pin blocks, new actions, uh, uh, every second or third piano I was tearing apart, com apart completely. And when I was doing that, I was spending a lot of time into measuring, uh, analyzing what I had in front of me. And before I dismantled the piano, I always were doing very th uh, thorough sound checks. I mean, uh, trying to evaluate the sound before and after, of course. And uh, in this regard also, then I came across a variety of soundboard uh, designs. I mean, different thicknesses, different shapes, um, uh, of course, they were not essentially very different, but in detail, you could say there was uh, quite a variety, different ribs, uh, uh, different spacing of ribs, etc., etc. And uh, one of the first things that um, caught my attention was studying string scales, because I found that uh, on many old pianos, but as well as on modern pianos, in particular the bass, uh, strings sounded very, this was uh, not a good sound, uh, dissatisfying, uh, sounding kind of muddy and, and uh, not clear enough in my view, or to my ears. So, and studying string scales was one thing that was, um, was t a teamwork with a peer of mine, a colleague who had finished piano building at Schimmel also. 
and he was studying sound engineering at the Dusseldorf uh, University. And since Dusseldorf was close to Bonn, so we were closely cooperating. And he was a theoretical guy, and I was the practical side. So we discussed often what factors we want to investigate. And uh, he was putting up the formulas, and I was checking it out practically. What difference does it make if you change string scales? And uh, yeah, next slide, please. I'll uh, interject one question that came along the way here from Alan Eder. He said, yeah. in your rebuilding shop, did you also replace soundboards? Yes, later on, not in the beginning. I was not daring to before I had experience in in such important uh, matters to tear apart the soul of the piano, so to say. I was trying to avoid it. I, I, from the onset, I did the typical repairs like cutting out and uh, laminating wedges into the, the cracks of the soundboard. But only later on, the, when I like, I would say like three, four years into my work, I, I, I was daring to get to the soundboard itself. So um, this is the next slide, yeah. Yeah, uh, while we were doing the studies with the uh, string scaling, I in particular, or we together with my friend, found out that um, the inharmonicity at bass strings, uh, what we learned at school while we were learning piano building was pretty much totally off track, uh, not according to the reality. And uh, in particular, the fact that we found out that a variable, that uh, inharmonicity is rather a variable, uh, not a constant. And uh, that's, uh, I will explain with the next slide, but uh, that's one major, let's say, uh, difference in understanding, uh, which relates also to tuning the piano. If it's um, understood at a constant and you, let's say, analyze your strings and you find out that and that in harmonicity. And so you go, go by that and you don't wonder anymore. But in actually, actually the, um, um, let's say once you have set and defined the scaling of the piano, or let's say in the case of an old piano, you would restring the piano according to the old measures. Then uh, anyway, whatever inharmonicity you have got, you have to go with it. And uh, in this regard, we found out also that the significance of the percentage load is rather, uh, rather more important than the inharmonicity. By means of inharmonicity differences, you hardly hear by ear. You can measure them, of course, but, uh, but the influence of the percentage load of the strings on the sound character uh, typically is way more influential on the final, so to say, balance of sound at the piano. Next slide, please. So, and here to touch that uh, uh, in harmonicity subject a little bit more in detail, the factors that determine in harmonicity, first of all, of course, is the steel copper relation, uh, the core, uh, how thick the core is, the core diameter in relation to the copper. And one thing that we found out is that's maybe a common knowledge, but um, I was focusing on that pretty much that the thicker, the, the bigger diameter at the steel core you have, the higher the inharmonicity typically goes. And uh, from this factor, for example, or studying this one factor, I learned that um, if you want to have a, as much as possible clarity in the note, and if you have the chance to restring a piano, you should always choose, recalculate the strings and always choose the core being as thin as physically possible, so to say, as it's possible to wind the string. If the core is too thin, then of course you run into the danger of uh, breaking the string during winding if the copper is too thick in relation to the core. So there is some limitations, but the principle, having the core as thin as possible, if you want to reduce in harmonicity. That's one very important factor I found out. And then, of course, the striking point is uh, influencing the inharmonicity. As we know, if you hit the string exactly at the nuts of the sound wave of the particular string, 
then uh, you have more harmonic uh, partials in the tone, in the string. And if you deviate from that point, you have more dissonant partials in the tone. Uh, I, I will not go into each of these points all too much in depth, but we can discuss about it later. And then the velocity of touch, how you hit the string. And in particular, clearly you can hear that at the bass strings of any piano and uh, in very, very significantly at Steinway grand pianos because they uh, have this habit to have very thick uh, core steel at the bass strings. And if you in particular go somewhat to the lower bass, and if you hit the string very softly, so as piano, pianissimo, then you will hear pretty much a round, nice tone without uh, too much enormity at all. And the, the more you increase the velocity, the harder you hit, the more you will hear the partials coming in, the, in, in particular also the dissonant partials. So that's another factor that uh, that's, has to be put in the variable, so to say. And naturally, hammer material and condition means having, if you have a harder hammer, naturally you have more high partials. <clears throat> Uh, if you have a softer hammer, less, so that's trivial actually. <clears throat> but also one factor that goes into the variable if you want to get close to the truth of inermicity at the piano. But fundamentally, and one of the maybe most significant things we found out to conclude the point about inermicity was that the base inharmonicity, typically if you express it in cent, which actually is nothing else than percent of a half tone, then uh, we were taught at school that the lower bass strings have some inharmonicity of values like two, three, four, five cent. And in reality, we found out that it's 30, 40, 50, up to even 100 cent. I mean, a note that you cannot define anymore at all. If you, for example, you take small pianos, and in America in particular, you have these, um, these cabinet pianos, the very small ones. And if you hit the bass string there, you will notice that it's just, just some sound. It's not a tone at all. It's totally impossible to define the tone. And why is it? That's because the inharmonicity is overlaying the basic frequency fundamental so much so as in su to such a degree that you cannot make out the fundamental anymore. And why is this important? Of course, it um, has a lot to do with the tuning of the piano. Let's say if somebody had explained me at school that this is a fact that you get like in part like 100 cent in normalicity, then I, of course instantly I would have asked, so how on earth do you tune such a string? But as long as they tell you, yeah, there's three, four, five, and don't worry, that's so is it, and just go and tune it by whatever principles, you don't wonder. So I found out during my practice as tuner, in particular also con doing concert tunings where you try to, to get as close as to an ideal tuning as possible, I found it very uh, obvious that the inner amnesty in the bass strings has is, a, is an important uh, aspect to factor in while teaching piano tuning in particular, because uh, once you know that, then for example, one consequence of this would be that you cannot very much rely on tuning octaves. The octave, for example, is the most forgiving interval at the entire tuning structure. You can tune, them, tune an octave, like say up to half, half, half hertz uh, closer, uh, narrower or wider, and if you look, if you listen to it as an octave, you would say it's yeah, it's fine. It sounds like an octave. And uh, but once you get to the chords, like comparing tenths, double tenths, and fifths, and and the octave plus fifth, uh, then of course we get to a total <laughs> different understanding of the tuning structure. But that's a big subject on its own, actually, and I would like to move on from here. The next, <coughs> percentage load, yeah. Uh, and just uh, a quick, 
quick yeah, questions uh, interjecting. There's a couple things that came up and maybe you're going to answer them, but just to make sure. Um, question is, you know, what is percentage load? If maybe there's a definition of it, you're going to present. Yeah. And uh, a question about a safe breaking percentage uh, for base strings. Does the percent load equal the breaking percent? But yeah, uh, the typical understanding, and let's say the theory is, of course, uh, not of course, but uh, would be at 100% uh, load, the, the string is close to breaking. And it's actually a, a, a factor that cannot be calculated at to 100% because it depends on other factors, whether the string, whether you can load it to 110%, let's say, practically. But in theory, it's the measure uh, 100 would be the breaking point, zero, it has no tension at all. And so the percentage load uh, that is, um, I don't know who of you is familiar with uh, Stephen Paolello, the French piano builder, uh, who has developed also various uh, different string categories. We will touch that subject a little later. And Stephen has on his uh, homepage, he has, for example, uh, Excel files to calculate scales. And the actually the only factor that is relevant in these scales or that he shows when you change the diameters, like the core and the copper, the only outcome he shows, because it's the most relevant, is the percentage load. And um, so that's also his, by his approach, it's... Um, similar to my approach, the most uh, significant factor to determine the scaling that's later, when you listen to the piano, that's as balanced as possible by means of the tonal character, in particular from note to note. Let's say if you have, for example, one note that has 50% percentage load and you would have the next tone, the next note to it, the neighboring tone 60% or whatever jump in the percentage load, then you also, uh, it's the, you hear a significant difference in tonal character. And I mean, one thing, one aspect, how I think every tuner has come across uh, situations where you have, for example, an old piano that hasn't been tuned for decades, and, you, and it's altogether lower, and you have uh, certain notes that are way lower. And you listen to these notes, then you, of course, you, you always hear a clear or the same with the new piano if you string it. And while it's very, has a very low percentage load, you hear a totally different sound character compared to once you put the string on pitch, so to say. And that's, that in itself also is an interesting subject to uh, discuss and in particular to experiment on which or what kind of percentage load gives what kind of result. And it also, of course, has to do with the question, what do you want? What, do you want a, a loud piano as loud as possible? Do you want a soft or rather uh, rather uh, uh, muted sound, uh, whatever the, the goal is, so to say? That also influences, of course, the decision how to, how to decide which percentage load you would like to go with. But in general, uh, talking about the balance of tonal character, my understanding, at least to my experience, it, I found also out that that's really the most important factor to pay attention to what percentage load the, the strings have from bass to treble. Um, 